KBG Voices is brought to you by the following sponsors. Calliope Games, publisher of Roll For It, Suro, and Enchanted Plumes. They publish tabletop games for players of all ages and skill levels. Their games are crafted to inspire laughter and fun. Board and Dice. Board and Dice designs and publishes family and strategy board games. Two of their most recent releases, Origins First Builders and Mandala Stones. They recently announced their ally program, primarily aimed at welcoming and supporting people of color and the LGBTQ plus community in the hobby. Hi everybody, I'm Starla. I'm Mitt. And we are Our Fan Plays Games. Games. Voices, yeah! <laughs> there we go, there we go! And welcome back to episode two! Two! We're at episode two! I'm excited! Yeah, me too. And still excited for this going on! I am, love it, I love am. it, love it! So, who are going to be this, mm. this episode's contributors? Well, this week, we're gonna learn how to play with Aaron from Game Enthus. Yes! We're gonna have a designer's corner with Fratessa Elise. Here we go, here we go! And then we're gonna be talking games with Maggie, Megan, and Chris from We're Playing Games. Oh, it's gonna be fun, y'all. It's gonna be fun! Yes. Here we go, here we go! And this week, we're gonna continue to talk about games from 2021. Yes, yes, just yes. ideas and things that came up in 2021. I'm excited! Yeah. I'm excited. Now, what I'm really excited for mm -hmm. is that my dear love over here, Starla, <laughs> is now going to introduce a new segment in the episode called Good Humans. So, let's all try to be good humans, and let's see what she has to say. Take it away, Starla. Hello, OFPG Voices, and welcome to our new segment called Good Humans. And this week, we're going to talk about Check your bias. What is bias? A personal and sometimes unreasoned judgment against a belief, thing, individual, or group. Biases can be innate or learned and are usually a closed-minded way of thinking. Let's face it, we all have biases. Having a bias doesn't make you a bad person because every bias is not negative. The inability to recognize bias is usually where the problem starts. Biases can be either implicit or explicit. So what is an implicit bias? An implicit bias is when we have attitudes towards people or associate stereotypes with them without conscious or knowledge. An explicit bias is when we are clearly aware of our prejudice and attitudes towards certain groups of people. Now, if you grew up in a family where diversity and inclusion was never discussed or looked at as unimportant or as a threat, then you may have a bias against those of us who fight for diversity and inclusion every day. Recognizing your bias is the first step to addressing it, understanding it, and hopefully changing it. There is no place for bias in the board game hobby. Board gamers should be accepted into the hobby regardless of race, color, ethnicity, gender, or sexual orientation. I always tell my family to meet people where they are, not where you want them to be. Check your bias. Stop leaning on the belief that this is just who I am. As humans, we are constantly changing, evolving, and growing, and we must do that in every aspect of life. Thank you for listening to Good Humans. And always remember the goal of OFPG Voices is to make this world a better place, one board gamer at a time. Yeah. Yes, Starla, I want to compliment you on that subject because that subject there is so mm -hmm. true for this nation mm -hmm. and also for this hobby for because hobby. bias is really a big, it's a plague Mm -hmm. On us, I agree. it's a it's a play. I totally agree. You know, and that that strong bias that people has mm -hmm. really hurts. Yeah, it hurts. And I'm just so happy that we have a show where we can talk about yes. these things that are important. Yes. and a little more serious. Yes. you know, people say, "Oh, it's just we're just playing games. It's, it's not shouldn't be this serious." But it is because we're humans. We're people. We come together, mm -hmm. and if we don't correct those things that tear us apart, yes. we bring all that to the board game. Time. That is so true. That is so true. So now, family, let's see these great contributors that we talked about, and let's find out what's going on with them. So here we go. Take it away. Hey, I'm Aaron from GameEnthus.com, and today I'll be teaching a game called Subastral. 
Subastro is a tableau building card game designed by Matt Riddle and Ben Pinchback with art from the prolific Beth Sobel and is published by Renegade Game Studios. So in Subastro, players are going to be collecting cards that represent eight different biomes, different environments essentially, and building out a tableau. Tableau building is essentially taking resources, cards, etc., and putting them out in front of you in a certain order to collect points. You got to go look at the box. Let's get to the teaching. So these are the components for Subastral, which are going to be comprised of six cloud cards. One, two, three, four, five, and then six. Which also has some iconography I'll be getting into in a moment. That'll be very helpful in playing the game. You're also going to have 103 biome cards. So there are eight different types of biomes. And there's only one number per card in the upper left, but there are going to be one through six, but there are eight different types and many of them, all of them, I guess I should say are going to have an indicator in the upper left corner about the, the rarity of, of that card. So this six subtropical desert is going to appear pretty frequently because there's three dots. However, this one temperate forest is going to be considerably more rare given it's one dot. And that will be key in hopefully allowing you to make decisions about which cars that you start off with, because that will make all the difference in the world. I will be doing a setup for a three player game, but there are cards that are only supposed to be used for a four player or a five player game. And those numbers will be in the bottom right corner of many of the cards. Okay, this is the scoring pad. It's used for scoring. These are just a bunch of the other biome cards or make up the biome deck. You guessed it, the starting player gets this card. And this is the sun card, which will be on the right side of the cloud cards. Let me show you how it sets up. This is what a setup for Sebastian might look like. You essentially take random cards from the top of the biome deck and place one card onto each cloud card. These are cloud cards. These six cards here are all cloud cards. This is the sun card. This is the biome deck. Each player will get three cards each. In terms of setting up the cards on top of the cloud cards, these six cloud cards, you would just take random cards from the top of the bomb deck and put one on each card and then take two more cards, but actually place those cards according to the numbers that are on them. So I happen to draw two, I put on the two cloud card, happen to draw three, put on the three cloud card. One thing I should also mention is what the objective of the game is. The objective of the game is to get the most points. And if you look at this reference card on screen now, that will show you how getting different sets allows you to score those points and come out victorious. It would also be apropos of me to mention how the game comes to an end. The game comes to an end when the game end card is revealed and then each player takes one more turn and that wraps the game up. All right, starting player is gonna be on the far left. This is the starting player's hand. I'll move this over here just for real estate purposes. Player one, the starting player has one, two and three threes, meaning they can place this two onto cloud car two or place one of these threes onto cloud car three. That's what they can do. Those are their options. They place this two right here. Their options are this. If you look up at the iconography on each cloud card with the exception of one and six, I'll get into that in a second. When you place a card onto a cloud card, you have two options. You can either Take the cards of any other cloud car that are less than it or to the left, however you want to look at it, based on this icon here, and put that card into your hand and then draw an additional card from the top of the deck. What that means is I placed in two, so my option is to take everything on cloud card one, take this six, it will go into my hand, and then I draw an additional card into my hand. That will be my turn. My other option would be to 
We look here at this iconography. This means uh, your tableau, like what's in what you're building out in front of you. What this icon means is I could take the cards on any other cloud car that are to the right or greater than where I placed. So three, four, five, six, obviously greater than two. They're also to the right of two. However you want to look at it. You want to look at it directionally. You want to look at it numerically. I've been saying left and right. The rules actually say the different actions are based on whether or not the cloud card is closer to the biome deck, the left, or whether or not the cloud card is closer to the sun card, the right. The whole trick of the game is if you see a card out here, you for the, a lot of times you can't just put it right into your hand. Or more importantly, you can't go right from your hand to your tableau. Back to player one. I placed in two and that would allow me to take everything in three and then start to build my tableau. Oh boy. So player three has a one, which is great. So one gets interesting. One and six kind of work the same way. So if you place a card in a one, you have basically two through six. You can take any one of those groups of cards and put them into your tableau. So it offers you a ton of options for placing into your tableau. Six does the opposite, offering you a lot more options to place cards into your hand, one through five. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take everything in two because two is greater than one and it's moving greater than one slash to the right of one slash closer to the sun card, which means I can put them into my tableau. So player three is starting off with three cards, three different biomes to work with. And then we repopulate. For cloud cards two through five, they have the standard options. The one and six have the option of taking both actions, which means placing in one means that you can take the cards in six and put them into your hand or put them into your tableau. Placing on six means you can take any of the cards on cloud card one and put them into your tableau or put them into your hand. So you get both options by playing a one or a six because they're on the ends. There's some hand management in the game too because when you run out of cards, your whole turn is just drawing one card from the top of the deck. Let's say, for example, this was my tableau at the end of the game. So for the top row, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I have seven of the eight biomes. So that'll be 28 points because I got seven in a mixed set. This top row is a single mixed set. So for the second row, I got one, two, three, four. I didn't, I can't go to five because I don't have another Arctic Tundra here. So it stops at four. That's 10 points based on this chart. So it really matters. Placement matters because as you get the same biomes in, you just place them on top of the same, the same kind. Had I gotten this tempered forest and it was here, had I gotten this first and it would have been to the right of a tropical rainforest, then it would have carried through. Everything has to go from left to right. And if there's a gap, then that stops that set you can score your two largest matching sets. I got four tempered forests and three chaparrales. So that would be seven points, one point for each card in those two individual largest groups of biomes. Sub astral. And that is essentially how sub astral is played. I hope you enjoyed the teach. Hope it was beneficial for you. My information should be in the description below. If you check out sub astral, let me know what you think. Thank you for watching. Hello, my name is Fratessa Elise, and I am joining you in this year of 2022 to talk about how to make your first board game. And it's okay if this isn't your first board game, how to make a board game. I wanted to approach this segment um, as if you are new to board gaming, to the hobby, and to game design, uh, because I was new not too long ago. Just four years ago, I started my journey in both board game design and in the hobby. And I found um, that I struggled because I was starting from a place um, where I had limited knowledge of, you know, what modern board gaming was, what kind of mechanics there were out there, and um, just the, the wealth of games that had been created. So for this segment, for this first one, I really want to go into what happens when you first have that moment of, aha, I really want to make a board game. Okay, so let's say you've had that moment, aha, I want to make a board game. Well, what do you do next? First, grab a sheet of paper or a notebook or a journal 
and I need you to answer three questions. That's probably all we'll have time for. So the very first question, and this is so, so, so important because it leads into all the other the three, the other two questions. Uh, first question, who is this game for? Who do you see playing this game? Um, and by who, I really want you to try and envision an actual person in front of you. So if it's playing with your kids, if it's playing with your friend, if it's playing with strangers, I need you to really uh, uh, visualize who this person is across the table from you or people and why you are targeting that particular audience. Um, it's very important that you don't generalize at this point of your journey because uh, a lot of people uh, like to say my game can be played by anybody and everybody and while there are mass market games that target a large you know amount of people for starting your very first game design it's really important to pin down a specific audience for your game because that's going to inform a lot of the things that you do um, and it's going to help narrow down this overwhelming amount of choices and options that you have when it comes to how you're going to design your game number two what is the weight and by weight I mean complexity level of your game this should be answered pretty easily based off of who your game is for. For example, if you're making a game for your kids, say eight years old, you're probably going to want a light game or a game that is light in complexity. Um, something that you can teach in, in five minutes and, and you can play in 20 minutes or less. Um, versus if you're, you know, designing a game for uh, an adult, in which case, there's a lot more wiggle room but then you have to really kind of think about why you want to design this game are you are you designing it because you want to see people um, kind of racking their brains trying to figure out this puzzle that you created or um, you know do you want them sitting silently trying to look through all the cards and, and figure out what is the optimal strategy uh, in order to win this game or do you see them sitting around a table laughing with each other smack talking table talk you know they're just having a good time and it doesn't really matter what you score but you kinda wanna win too like that vibe is very important and it plays into the complexity level of the game and also into the very first question of who is this game for who do you see playing this game the last question uh, which is also very important is why is this game important to you and there is no right answer for this particular question um, but it does need to have an answer because as you start your game design journey there are going to be so many different sources of information you're going to get so much feedback from strangers friends family and you are going to be overwhelmed at some point by just how many directions you can go and that can really lead to this uh, creative block that a lot of us find ourselves against so before you get to that point I found it to be very helpful to establish what the identity of the game is and why it's important to you because when you get to that wall and you're wondering is it worth it to put all this effort into this game um, it does my game have a place in the gaming world why am I making this it's great to already have your answer why are you making this is it for you is it just to prove that you can is it because you want to have something special to share with people around you is it because you want to reach out to other people and and just have something that you can say was yours there is again no correct answer it just needs to have an answer why is this special why would people play this um, and with those three questions you are ready to start your game design journey.
and I will see you in the next segment. Hi, we're We're Playing Games, and today, congrats to the class of 2021, we've got senior superlatives for board games coming now. Thank you. <laughs> Our pick for biggest flirt goes to... Dream crush. Dream crush. In this game, you have three crushes, and you slowly learn more and more about them to figure out which one's your crush for life. Some of them are bad. Some of them are really good. Some of them are fine. We laugh. So oh, much. We laugh. If you want a new party game that nobody's ever played before, <laughs> play Dream Crush. Dream Crush is patient. Dream Crush is kind. Okay, okay. Dream okay. Crush is... <laughs> the award for biggest underdog goes to... Whirling Witchcraft. In this game, you draft ingredients, push your luck. <laughs> You draft ingredients, push your luck, and try to overflow the person next to you. It's all about turn order and sabotaging your friends. We did not expect to love this game as much as we did, but now we dream about it. Oh. That looks bad. <laughs> next up for biggest rivalry, we have Unmatched, a Battle of Legends, part two? Volume, Volume two. <laughs> and an upset, Rift Force. These are two head-to-head -head combat tactical games. They're both so good, we couldn't just pick one. Fight! 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 <laughs> fight, fight, fight! 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 Most artsy goes to Keystone, North America. Put the box right here, Chris. Okay. This is a great little tableau builder where you want the cutest little chunky animals, but you also have to keep an eye out on your science. It's a very pretty game. The illustrations are top-notch and really draw you in. And we love Rose Gauntlet. Plug! I that? That's a plug! <laughs> Fellow gay. Secrets out. <laughs> Our award for most likely to be president goes to <coughs> Big Boy Oath. It's semi-asymmetrical. You're tracking an entire empire through the rise and fall of their highest leaders. The most fun thing about this game for me is that the role you play changes every time. So since I won the last game, I'm now the chancellor of the empire. It's gorge. It's heavy. It's not for everyone. No. But it's but it is for us. For us. <laughs> Our next award goes to the most beautiful inside and out canvas. In this game, your artist competing to paint the greatest paintings. Unlike other set collection games, this one, it's very beautiful while you do it. You're very proud of the final painting because there's transparent cards that add elements. So it's very fun to play and very beautiful thing to look at. You also have different objectives every time, so no game you're ever going to play is going to be exactly the same. Play map. <laughs> Little bits, clear cards, sold. <laughs> the award for best car, which I won in high school. Big brag. Dinosaur World. Wow. For the invention of the Jeeple. It's got all the theme park building goodness, but your focus is really there in the park. I had a Velociraptor Dining culinary ex experience. I had a ring toss where you threw them onto Triceratops. I built a nerd park where it was mostly incubators and like DNA testing labs. I won by 60 points. <laughs> so there you go. Our next award for biggest drama queen goes to what next? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this game is basically... Fun for me, Survivor the board game. You have three different scenarios, and you're walking through the narrative, and as you do, you come up on little mini games dexterity challenges. Like, you gotta flick a stone, or climb a tree, or build a tower. For most moody. Moodiest. It's Umbravia. Umbravia. In this game, you're exploring a dark, secluded uh, magic garden trying to make paths and cast spells. It has a very good moody vibe. I feel calm, cool, and collected while playing, and it's pretty. I lose every <laughs> single time I play this game. I lose significantly. The award I think we've all been waiting for. That's right, best dressed is coming down. It's b b b brood In this game, you really get immersed into the world and it's surprisingly cutthroat. It's a great game. I love saving a uh, winter forest so I can have my fire salamander follow me around. 
that's my kind of game. Next up, we have our award for hardest worker. No surprise, it's gonna be a worker placement game. What's it's that? Cryo. Cryo me a river, baby. Cryo is a super, super tight worker placement game. You're obviously in space. You're trying to float around all these different spaceship platforms and planets and gather supplies, but you have like 10 turns max to do like a lot of stuff. We thought it was gonna be a game about like maximalism, but it's really about doing the most you can with the smallest amount of time. As we were going through all the games on our shelves that were 2021 games, it was even more of some of our favorite games than we anticipated it being. Thank you so much to Our Family Plays Games for having us as a part of OFPG Voices. Community. Community. If you liked looking at us uh, yell about games and being really excited about them, we are, we're playing games. Cause we are. Playing. Games. <laughs> <laughs> We've never done that. <laughs> oh, that yes. was awesome. Love them. <laughs> love love the them. Oh, love them. And they are so good. Yes, they are. They are all good. Yeah, all we are good. We're thinking about bringing on a couple more. Yes, we are. We've yes, we are. We're in talks. We're in talks. Yeah. So you guys stay tuned so you can see yes. the new voices yes. we're going to bring Because we're going to bring out more voices mm -hmm. so we can be heard, y'all. We're going right. to keep being heard and seen. <laughs> heard and yes. seen. Yes. And we want to say thank you to our awesome sponsors. Yes, we do. Board and Dice. And Calliope Games. Yes, we love you guys and appreciate that you guys are on this journey with mm -hmm. us and really are seriously, you know, supporting this channel mm -hmm. and then uh, this channel and this episode yeah. of what it stands for. Our mission of diversity it. and inclusion. Yes, yes, we love it. We love it. So, Starla, what's, what's the next episode coming out? Our next episode will be out in about two weeks on February 2nd. So don't miss it. Don't miss it. And then Starla, what about the merch? What about the great, great merch they can find? Well, you know what? If you don't have any OFPG gear, yeah. what you waiting for? What you waiting for? You can find our merch on spring.com. Mm -hmm. Get a shirt, a mug, sweatshirt, hoodie. Get something. Get something. Yes. Support us. Your support helps us continue to grow this channel yeah. and keep us bringing on more contributors. Now, Starla, last thing. Mm. Where can they find OFPG voices and... OFPG. If you're looking for our family plays game, yeah. you can find us on Facebook, yes. Instagram, uh -huh. Twitter, yeah. right here on YouTube. Right here <laughs> on YouTube. And yeah. of course, that's where you're going to find OFPG voices as well. <laughs> that's right, that's right, that's right. Now, family, we love that you're on this journey with us and checking out these uh, these voices mm -hmm. that we're going to keep giving you. And family, we want to know, we wanna, want you to know, and always know, we love you. All right. Bye, everybody.